Okay, it's just it's just pure magic. It's pure magic. Okay, ready, ready. Okay, so we'll get it. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> this video is talking about one of the cheapest but also most amazing lenses you can get for the Panasonic. Uh, or the just the general Micro Four Thirds system, and it is the Panasonic 12 to 32 millimeter f 3.5 to 5.6. Now it is absolutely tiny. Uh, it has a pretty rubbish focal range and a pretty rubbish aperture range, um, but it's something which I would recommend everyone to have. So if you're not into Panasonic or anything like that, I'm still going to try and make this interesting because. What it what this little lens can do blows away APS-C and full frame cameras. Just it embarrasses them so much, um, and it's so tiny. It's so tiny. I need to weigh it actually because it is so small. If we take off the lens cap and we weigh it, it is seventy one grams. Once we add it on, so on the GH four this is pretty much adding nothing. In fact, if I add the GH the GH4 with a um with a base plate for a tripod is 588 grams. Add on the tiny little lens, 659 grams. It's barely adding anything to it. However, what I think it looks best on is the Panasonic GX8 if you have the silver one. So they're pretty pretty close to being the same same styles of silver. Now when so what what it's current the current position that is in is its traveling position. This is its you can't use it when it's like this. You have to zoom it out a little bit, and then that's when you can start using it. That's at 12, 12 millimeters which in full frame terms is the equivalent of 24 millimeters. So it's considered to be slightly wide, wide, uh, wide angle. It's, it's pretty much, if I was doing it on this camera, it's like that. So that's the difference we would have. So the, the camera I'm shooting with just now is a, a seven to 14 millimeter. So that's like ultra super duper wide. But this, let's turn it on, let's take a photo is this wide from here. Anyway, it is, it's tiny, it's light. It also has image stabilization in this tiny lens. I don't know how it does it. And when you combine it with a camera like the Panasonic GX8, which has in-camera image stabilization, they work together in a dual image stabilization so you can slow down your shutter speed to unbelievably slow levels of shutter. Now, one of the, now here's the main thing which I want to talk about, why this is just insanely powerful lens in comparison to a lot of full frame lenses, is its speed of focus. It is freaking unbelievable. If First of all, it's got a very close focusing distance. Let's set something up for me to focus on. This giraffe. Uh, or should I use this teddy bear? I'll use the teddy bear. Teddy bear is cuter. It's called Berlin, is what it's called. And um, so its closest focusing distance is 20 centimeters. But what does that mean when you're actually using it? So if I just check here, put it on top of this, it's close. Focusing. It's totally focused. Let's get closer. Still focusing, closer. Boom, and if you notice, we're getting a nice shallow depth of field. Can we get any closer? Now, I don't know if I can get closer, but what I can do is I can go to manual settings. Now this, this lens, that's the zoom ring. It's a zoom ring, it's not a, it's not a focusing ring. So you're thinking, how do you manually focus? Well, that's where, it becomes a bit of a faff and you have to go into the menus. I'll show you via using my other camera right here. So now what I've got is I've got my Panasonic GH4 recording my Panasonic GX8 so we can see exactly what we're having to do. For me to do manual focusing, I need to click it into manual focusing and then this button at the side here 
which has that bit there, brings up a different screen, and then if we press center, we then have this up and downy bit to, to manual focus. So let's say we bring it down. You can see we've got a little our little kind of interesting little tree looking thing there. Bring it down. Tree and a flower. The flower means we're at the closest. And then we've got the focusing area there where we can see what is in focus. And what we've got, we've got peeking on and we can see it's just focused on his eye up there. And then we can take a photo. Boom. Now, that's, so that's, that's how close we can get. That's not the important thing. The next thing is how fast it can focus from, let's say, far away to its closest focusing distance. So we'll go back to the camera here. What I'll do is I'll just flip the screen so it's back like that. So we've got a smaller screen. And we'll go to um, AFS, so single point. We'll just have it pointed on the teddy bear. And if we go from here, I'll change the focusing so it's so focused. This is at oh, we'll get it so it's at its maximum aperture. Oh, there. Uh, that's at f3.5. Boom. Boom. See that again? Boom. Boom. Look, that was like instant. And so at the moment, it's focused way on that lamp away over there. Focused on that lamp away over there. Take a photo. Just as soon as I press the shutter, it focuses. So it's focused on the teddy bear. And if I take the teddy bear away... And again, if I bring the teddy bear... So it's focused on the lamp over there. And if I bring the teddy bear... Boom! Just instantaneous. Instantaneous focus. Um, again, if we do video, it silently focuses. We've got an EFS. If I move the teddy bear away... Up! Boom, that's it focused to the lamp in the background. Bring the teddy bear back. Bring it into the focusing area. There you go. Move the teddy bear away. I don't need to do anything. It will just autofocus. Boom. So the autofocusing speed is fantastic. It's the speed that it can go from pretty much infinite infinity to as close as it can get is unbelievable. It additionally has the image stabilization in there and what I'll do is at the end of this video I'll show you all the really boring tests which I've done like taking pictures of walls, taking pictures indoors of worksheets and stuff like that but I'll just give the example here with the cute teddy bear because the teddy bear always wins. It's how slow a, 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 a shutter speed, a, a, an exposure, I can go of a teddy Indoors. I'll, I'll try and make it a little bit darker. It's quite bright in here. Uh, and we'll, I'll we'll put it into shutter mode. And I'm going to take a picture of this teddy, handheld, realising after having vast amounts of coffee this morning. So, what are we shooting at? Hundredth of a second piece of cake. Let's see. Focusing on the teddy. In fact, I'll take my elbows off the table so we've got full body shake. Hundredth of a second, piece of cake. Let's go, let's go hardcore. Twentieth of a second at 12 millimetres, which is 24 millimetres when you consider the two times crop factor. Um, this should be this should be the limit of the, the shutter exposure length before blur comes in. And you hear how slow that was, that you can actually hear that going click, click. Okay. Let's half that. So this is one stop. Uh, if we go from 20, one full stop is all the way down to a tenth of a second. Boom. The next one, I've got to go down an other stop, a fifth of a second. So this is two stop. Is it two stops? Yeah, it's two stops. Ready, steady. Oh, that's scary, hearing the shutter going open, close. <sighs> okay, going for three stops. We're going to bring it down to two and a half. Two and a half seconds, is that right? Let's see. We're at ISO, we're, wait a minute. Auto ISO, we're at, um, what do you call it? We're at aperture F13, which may not be the best aperture for this. Let's see. Oh, that's scary. Is that in focus? 
we'll check later on. And then last one, let's take it down to 1.3. Heck, let's go for a whole second. Ooh, a whole second exposure. Not a chance, not a chance. Let's see. Not a chance, it's nice and blurry, yeah. <laughs> that was a ridiculous amount. Um, doing a whole second hand, a whole second handheld exposure. Uh, that, no, that's not, not gonna happen, not gonna happen. But, impressive results nonetheless. The lens randomly came with uh, a, a thing, uh, a, a, what do you call it? Lens hood, a, a metallic lens hood, even though it's a, plastic lens and when you have it on you can't put on the lens cap okay I just put on the lens cap but it, it's not on because like look it just goes it just falls out it just falls out like I'm sure it fell out before have I just looked no but see it's not actually in it's not actually on see see it just pings out um so the so the lens hood you're never going to use it's completely pointless Annoyingly, this, for me, for my big hands, this lens cap is very small and piddly. It's very small and very easy to fall out. Um, there are better lens caps like these ones where you've got the actual things to hold on to so my fingers can go in snip. That's better. Uh, I'm sure it's probably something which I can just buy but these ones are very easy to just, to just fall out my fingers. Um, so that's, so yeah, lens cap's a bit annoying and uh, lens hood, completely pointless. What it does have though is a metal for this one, this one is a, look how shiny that is, shiny, 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 a metal connection thing here. So that, that just means you've got a bit more of a secure connection. It's not weather proofed, it's not weather resistant. And when you put it on and you haven't extended the lens, it's saying, hey, extend the lens and you can still do all the menu stuff, but it won't let you take any photos. So I can't take any photos, obviously, because the lens needs to be extended before it does anything. However, what I would say is just for weight-wise, size-wise, and I just think that looks kind of cool. If I put that there, I just think that is a cool little thing. And it does, although it's an odd focal range, this is my go-to lens now. Like, I've got, the other one I've got is the, the 14 to... 42 so it's a longer range and it's got a manual focus um, Ring which is handy. It's equally as light, but it's just a little bit a little bit big And I think it works fine on the Panasonic GH4. I think it looks good good there, but for <laughs> like a Photographer like, a, like I'm, I'm just really enjoying photography and part of it is the aesthetics aesthetics of the gear that you're playing with, like for the the GH GX8, the button dials feel good, all the dials feel good. They feel nice, firmly weighted. Although I did cut myself on it because it was so sharp at the, at one point. I, I like how the little thing comes up there, um, and just having this fully articulating screen is just so beneficial for so many things, especially if you've got a young child and you're just like, I'm just going to go to the zoo. This is just, it is, it is fully pocketable. Let me find that lens cap, which I've just lost. Yep, <laughs> lens cap went under the sofa there. The fact that even, like, hanging this from my neck, like, a lot of photographers go, oh my god, I need to buy a special lens strap and all that because the, the, you can't hang it around my neck. This is totally neck hangable. Absolutely neck hangable. It weighs effectively nothing. And if you're doing shoulder hangable, it is, again, it's apps. It's just so light and easy. The only thing, again, as I said, because the lens cap is effectively uh, on show and you have no lens hood, it, there is a chance of it just rubbing against something and going ping <laughs> off like that. Unlike if you have this hanging down, the lens hood or the lens cap is away in there and it's not going to fall out. Um, so that, that's the only thing that I would worry about this, but it's such a cheap little lens and to the point where with the GX8 If you take the if you take the strap off you can almost go In I'll take my blooming trousers jacket out I can have a full-on 20 megapixel image stabilization lens 
from a wide angle 24 to telephoto 62, 64 millimeters um, in my pocket. Mm, nice! Depends obviously how big your pockets are. What I will say though is because it's not weather sealed, I would be uh, nervous of taking this to somewhere like the beach. And again, because there is a lot of lens extension going in and out, when that's extending in and out, there is there has to be air going in and out somewhere. It's not a vacuum in there. So there is a slight worry if I was at the beach and there's little bits of grit flying away and stuff getting stuck in there, it would get gritty and potentially it's just blowing crap onto the sensor. So that's the one thing I worry about with these types of lenses. Unlike, say for example, if you have like a prime, like the 25mm, there's nothing moving that requires any air. Uh, same with the, the 20mm or the 60mm. Um, the the G, the 14 to 42, there's a tiny bit of movement, but far, far less than this having to suddenly just go, when you extend it, it sucks in air. And then when you close it down, it's pushing air out. And you just think, oh, that could be potentially putting a lot of grit and dirt on your sensor. So this is really my indoor, in the garden, at the zoo, but not at the beach uh, kind of lens. Uh, maybe if you're outside at, a, at an event, yeah, absolutely uh, a good lens to use. Uh, maybe at nighttime, if you are going to like a, a fireworks thing, boom, this would be the lens to use. You can hold almost one second long exposures. And if you were handheld, score, you're doing fireworks shots with a single lens. Anyway, um, I'm a big fan of it and it's fairly cheap. It was around about, uh, I think it's about 200 pounds, which is comparatively cheap. The cheapest lens I've got is the, the 25 millimeter f1.8, which was 160 pounds, um, which is, fantastic as well but what I will say though is optically this is on the G on the Panasonic system on the micro four third system I haven't yet found a bad lens they all create fantastic images one of the complaints that some people say is oh you don't get any depth of field with micro four thirds well as you just saw there a minute ago we get creamy depth of field with this lens even at f5.6 and you're zoomed out to only what 32 you're getting um, like proper mushy backgrounds, which is fantastic. So right, now we'll head on and do the, the boring, let's look at wall tests uh, to see what you think of the image quality and also the um, image stabilization effects indoors. Okay, cheers, thanks for watching everyone, bye-bye. Okay, here's one of the few places where it's dark enough, it's uh, literally I'm in a hole lit by a single light where I'm gonna be able to actually test out the image stabilization. Just seeing something on the wall here. That's got a good bit of info. We'll see how good it is for the photos. Now, in terms of handhold image stabilization for when doing in video, seems pretty stable, but that's at wide angle. Let's zoom in. Handheld image stabilization. Any kind of vibrations from my caffeine intake are nicely smoothed out from me just standing. So, simple, easy test. Quite happy with the results so far. Okay, so here is the more detailed look at the photos which I've taken and uh, with the 12 to 32 millimeter. So here is a simple kind of street photo. This is at its widest at 12 millimeters and uh, just showing the kind of look that you get. This is at f5.6 so pretty much everything is in focus. One of the benefits of uh, the Micro Four Third system is you have a, a lot of depth of field. Um, uh, lots of stuff that's in focus. So here Pretty much every, like even from the side of this house all the way to the middle of that uh, cathedral, all in focus. Um, so that's at 12 millimeters. Its zoom range to 32 looks like that. 12 to 32. Let's see if I can figure out what that is in crop. 
damn, there's not a thing that tells me, but it's kind of that much of a crop. That's how much of a zoom we're getting with 12 to 32 times zoom. If we go to the next photo, it looks pretty much, yeah, pretty much that's what I've cropped into there. If I just click OK from that one to that one, yeah, pretty much that's that's pretty much what I got there. Um, now, also looking at the idea of do you get shallow depth of field? And with this lens, yes, you do. Look at, but what, what you have to be is you have to be incredibly close to the subject. So look at the lovely buttery smoothness that we've got. And that's at f3.5 and at 12 millimeters. Something which people think you just can't get out, out, of, out of field looking shots, if that's the right phrase. Um, and here again, look at that cathedral tower is just buttery mush. The only problem is you have to be incredibly close to your subject. So the subject here is this um, railing post. So that's at 32 millimeters and that's at f5.6. So that's how close you're able to get. I thought about doing it from the other angle. Let's see, looking down here. So looking down at something, look at the lovely um, weeds. <laughs> how they're just beautiful orange blobs. Uh, so th that was at 12 and that's at uh, 32 f5.6. So yeah, you can absolutely get depth of field. And if you want to suddenly make that disappear, all you need to do is go back a couple of centimetres, let's see, a couple of centimetres back, boom, everything's in focus. Well, that's f. Uh, that's at f9. There's still f9. No, there's that f5.6. Pretty much everything's in focus again, just because I've just gone back a tiny amount uh, of distance. So yeah, you can get shallow depth of field if you try really, really hard. Uh, here's another example that I got. Shallow depth of field, look, you can't even make out the details of the bus that's there, but you can make out the amazing crisp details of this uh, pedestrian thing. But again, if you want to have it all in focus, just step back a tiny amount, pretty much everything's in focus now. Uh, that's that's the kind of cool thing. So yeah, if you just get really close to things, then you get shallow depth of field. I've also got some video, which uh, I'll show you here. Uh, let me just press play. Here is the man, I think I had it on manual focus on its closest focusing distance. And it even tells me it's at 12 millimeters. So this is wide angle, that's me zooming in. Look at the background. Look at the lights of the street. Is that is that not shallow depth of field? That's what I call shallow depth of field. Who says you can't get shallow depth of field on a micro four thirds? And that's at 32 millimeters. That's nothing. And there, if I just start to let it focus towards the background, suddenly everything's pretty much in focus. Still the same aperture and everything, just a little bit further forward focus. Look at that. Look at that going into mush. Brilliant, brilliant. So now let's go into the really dull, <laughs> so dull. <laughs> um, uh, this was the slow shutter speed test. So here I was looking at a worksheet. The worksheet here has just got a whole, so here if I zoom in one to one, we can see the dates. So everything here, this is 125th of a second. Yeah, everything is, I can read that, not a problem. I can read all the details down here. Let's see, this is at 12 millimeters, 60th of a second, fine. 30th of a second, fine. 15th of a second, whoo. So remember 12 millimeters is equivalent to 24 millimeters. Um, still absolutely fine. Going down to a sixth of a second, Absolutely fine. <laughs> Let's get down to 0 0.4 of a second. That's a bit mushy. However, it's a little bit blurry, but I can still... R Remember, this is from all the way out here. I can still read every date and every letter on that piece of paper. And then this must have been the last one. Uh, well, half a second. No, half a second. I can still read the small print on a piece of paper that far away. Let's see if we go to, I went, this was a full one second exposure. That's, that's nuts. This is me just standing in an alleyway. There is a bit of blur, but that is a saved image. That is an image that you can use. I can read stair cleaning at edinburghgov.uk there. Brilliant. So yeah, I, I, <laughs> So I managed to go to one second handheld exposure in an alleyway 
uh, the camera had to go to f9 for that. So here, here's the zoomed in, 32 millimeters, hundredth of a second. Let's, oh god, that is like super zoom. Is it? Is there, what's the smallest text? Let's go down here. So hundredth of a second, perfectly fine. A sixtieth of a second, perfectly fine. A thirtieth of a second. So that's where we should be a level. Actually, no, we should have been a sixtieth of a second where it should have been absolutely fine. Here, fifteenth. I can't tell the difference between a fifteenth and a thirtieth. So fifteenth of a second, very good. Next one, oh, a sixth of a second at thirty-two millimeters. Not still really good. Half a second. It's uh, not so great. But yeah, it's still at one second. It just looks like it's slightly out of focus rather than uh, having motion blur. <laughs> like, absolutely astonishing. Absolutely astonishing. Uh, let's see, was there any other shots that I did with this? Okay, so here, here we're looking at the image quality. Uh, so okay, dullest photo in the world. Here we're looking at image quality, um, and the important bits is that the size and also vignetting. So if we look at this shot, if we go from widest angle, 12 millimeters, at uh, f3.5, so it's a brightest aperture, to f5, so one stop down, uh, notice the edges get a little bit brighter. In fact, they get a lot brighter. If we zoom in up here, if we click from one to the next, big brightness change. You can, see, you can even see it in the histogram itself. The histogram moves along a little bit. So there is vignetting which is giving the, the the image a little bit of darkness around the edges going on there. Um, so yeah that is that's noticeable. However, as we go to the middle side, uh, F3 point no let's go to 3.5 that is crystal sharp. That is absolutely perfectly sharp. And at F5 I'm seeing no gain in difference, apart from a little bit of vignetting, absolutely perfect. Um, if we go to, let's see, we've got it to 32, 32 millimeters. Uh, so at its widest aperture, is that 5.6? And then I went to f8, so one stop difference. Do we see a brightness difference? You can see in the histogram there's a tiny movement to the right. Am I seeing it? Yes, F8, so it's stopping down one um, from F5, F5, was it F5.6 to F8, yeah, that is one stop, um, is is quite a big difference. No, is F5.6 to F7.1? Oh, I can't remember, I can't remember. Um, but, uh, so stopping down one when you're at 32 will increase the brightness, but however, if we look at the image quality up here, there, it's. I can't tell the. Di oh, I can't. Okay, F8 is a little bit sharper. But we are going one to one on a full Mac screen, and it is just astonishing. It is so good. Um, let's see, what was the last one? F22. That's where it's going to get pretty. So going to small apertures definitely sucks. Um, that's, that's a definite. But the, the other shots. The image quality is something which you cannot complain about. I'm going to show you some of the, any other images that I've got out of my catalogue here that I've taken with this lens. <laughs> yeah, so I've I've done 836 photos with this lens. Uh, and if I can describe to you, a lot of them are selfies. Selfies with my kids. Let's see any other ones. Again, more selfies in the tent. Cute. More selfies. Also, some property shots, some skyline shots, some building shots, some view shots from houses, done that, some stairwell shots, did them, getting shots of the fronts of properties, um, famous buildings in Edinburgh, uh, building areas, yeah, done a few properties in here, cool bridges, so yeah, that's, 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 a, nice, that's a nice shot, that's a cool bridge in Edinburgh, down at the Leith Docks. Um, but yeah, done quite a few down. Oh, that was before all the trees got their leaves, leaves, and uh, yeah. So there, there's a nice idea of again of the zoom range again, all the way over there to here. Now we can see that we're at the restaurant that's kind of on the water, and trying to get lens flare going on. 
Again, did it for some more property shots. Here's a nice one. Oh, what was that? That was kind of showing. Look at Arthur's seat. The view all the way down there. Look at that. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> nice shot of my dad sitting watching TV. Again, shots from in the garden. Playing the garden. That's that's. It's such a kind of family-friendly camera and lens. That's what it's about. And definitely one for taking out to the zoo. It is the zoo. You know, happy days out the zoo. Go and take cool shots with that. So that's generally what it's been used for, and uh, and its image quality is absolutely stellar. Uh, one hundred percent recommended by for smallness, lightness, compactness, um, and uh, and price. It's good price as well. So there you go, there's my review. Hope you enjoyed it. Cheers, bye-bye. One last thing is that if you are on my photography channel, you may not know that I've got two other channels. One is my exercise channel, which you can check out, which is Don Bauer Exercise. Uh, I think the actual name is just youtube.com forward slash Don Bauer. And I've also got another one on this channel. Uh, so this is, I've got Dom's Talks. And a lot of that is going to be about well, me dealing with my first ever newborn baby, uh, little Logan Bauer, uh, born on the 4th of September. Uh, and so I'm, I'm learning to be a dad. So that's all my mistakes and all the things which I'm learning which are quite useful. So if you want to see more about little Logan and how he's getting on, check out Dom's Talks. And if you want to see, oh, I've also got Dom's Flights as well. So uh, again, I'm doing a lot of stuff flying my DJI Phantom. Uh, around the places uh, and also going through the, the process of getting the, li the license to do it commercially. So if you want to see how I'm doing that, check out the Dom's Flights channel as well. I should put all the links to down below. So thanks for watching. Bye-bye.